Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Whenever you're joining us here today, Restoration Bible Fellowship, I am your host, Dr. Eric Stansbury. Welcome to Restoration, and so glad that you're with us. Stay tuned. We're going to have some music. We're going to have a, a study in the Word in Hebrews chapter number uh, 8, I'm sorry, chapter number 9, as we look at a better tabernacle. Call a friend, tell somebody to come join us so that you can be restored today by God's Word. I've never been this homesick before. There's a light in the window, a table spread in splendor. Someone standing by an open door. I can see a crystal river. Lord, I must be near forever. Lord, I've never been this homesick before see a bright light shine oh it's just about old time and i can see my father standing at the door this world has been a wilderness i'm ready for deliverance lord i've never been this home sick before i can see the family gathering sweet faces all familiar no one's old or feeble anymore my lonesome heart is crying think i'll spread my wings for flying lord i've never been this old sick before see a bright light shine it's just about old time and i can see my father standing at the door this world has been a wilderness and i'm ready for deliverance lord i've never been this home sick before see a bright light shine it's just about old time i can see my father standing at the door this world has been a wilderness i'm ready for deliverance lord i've never been this old sick before see a bright light shine oh it's just about old time and i can't see my father standing at that door this world has been a wilderness and i'm ready for deliverance lord i've never been this old sick before lord i've never been this home sick before hi so glad that you're with us here today if you have your bible nearby let's go to hebrews chapter number nine and while you're doing that let's go to the lord in prayer can you remember all of those pastors are crossing the picket lines today to preach the word of god also remember my wife she has a special need remember lee and kim ball billy and bobby parker crystal parker and all of those who are overseas and at the particularly the christians in ukraine and russia who are right now facing some new types of persecution and in china let's pray father god we thank you so much for your love your mercy your power your grace and your glory we thank you god that you hear us when we pray and that you're able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can think or we can ask or even imagine and today we give you praise and give you glory Lord, change all of the things that I think and say into the things you would have thought and the things that you would have said. And we're going to give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in Hebrews chapter 9, we start reading with verse number 1. That first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship. And in a place of worship here on earth, there were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room were a lampstand, a table, and sacred loaves of bread on the table. This room was called the holy place. Then there was a curtain, and behind the curtain was called the second room, called the Most Holy Place. In that room 
were a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered with gold on all sides. Inside the Ark was a gold jar containing manna, Aaron's staff that sprouted leaves, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above, er, above the ark was the cherubim of divine glory, whose wings stretched out over the ark's cover, the place of atonement. But we cannot explain these things in detail now. So the writer here is talking about looking at the ark of the covenant. So we're now moving to the, the heavenly, tab the uh, earthly tabernacle, because in the c concluding parts of the chapter, he's going to really begin to deep dive into the spiritual applications. We may start to touch on that today. So to understand that the earthly tabernacle, first of all, was designed by God himself. We find the designs given to Moses in Exodus chapters 25 through 31. Every measurement and set up in the camp was purposeful. It was 45 feet long, 15 feet wide, 15 feet high. You had two rooms, the holy place and the holy of holies. And this was then the camp was set up that each of the tribes had certain places that they needed to be uh, in that position. Why is this important? Well, it's important because everything that God does, he does with a purpose. And everything that he did with the Old Testament church, which was Israel, he did to teach us the New Testament church, the new Israel, or the same Israel grafted in, how things should be. He said, first of all, in the inside the first room, there was a lampstand, which provides the only light in the tabernacle. And since we are now the new tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, we should know that Jesus Christ is the only light in our lives. He had the table of showbread with 12 loaves. Each loaf represented the 12 tribes and God's fellowship with them. Jesus would say, except we take of his body, we have to eat the bread from heaven. And he said in John chapter 6 that he was the bread from heaven. There was the altar of incense whose white smoke represented the prayers of Israel to God. You see, you and I, our prayers should always ascend up. Our praise should always ascend up to the throne of God, to his holy altar of incense. Everything that we will see in this earthly tabernacle has a heavenly uh, counterpart that does that has the exact same function. Then you had the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies is where the presence of God dwelt, in where his presence was. And then in there was the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, you have three things. The, the table of covenant, Aaron's rod that budded, and, of course, the, a pot of manna. The manna represented God's provision that Israel became increasingly ungrateful for. Aaron's rod that budded was a reminder that Israel did not want the authority of God in their life, but wanted their own authority. And then, of course, the, the tablets of covenant, the Ten Commandments, were there to remind Israel of their failure to keep God's law. Now, all of this was in there because just like us, We've rebelled against the authority of God. We have wanted to do our own thing and been increasingly ungrateful for the things that God has done, not only in your life, but through your life. What does that mean? That means that we need to learn to be a more grateful people. Then you had the mercy seat with the two cherubims whose, whose wings would touch, and this was a place of forgiveness where the blood was sprinkled to cover the sins of ungratefulness and rebellion and sin. You see... And we're going to find later as we go on that Jesus Christ will perfectly cover and, and forgive sin if we are willing to hear what thus saith the Lord. Now, not only this, the tabernacle traveled with the people. It wasn't a building that they traveled to. It traveled with them. Why is that important? Worship and the presence of God is not confined to a place. Even when Solomon was dedicating the temple in, in, in uh, First Chronicles, he said, look, Second Chronicles, he goes, even if, you know, if the heavens cannot contain thee, how much less can this earthly building contain you? It is imperative that you and I quit getting the idea. We talked about this last week when Jesus told the woman at the well, he goes, you're not going to worship at that mountain or this mountain, but you're going to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Worship needs to be your lifestyle. Worship needs to be the thing that drives you. We know that God is enthroned on the praises of his people. That is how if you want the presence of God in your life, don't go bring him into your bring him into your home, bring him into your life. Worship and praise that it continually ascend. Don't make worship that once a week thing that you do maybe on Sunday morning, possibly maybe on a Sunday night somewhere. Maybe even if you were lucky, you'll go to a Wednesday night. But no matter where you do, you're worshiping at home. You're worshiping in the car. You're worshiping every place you go. There's worship going forth. Because if worship is taking place, if worship is happening, what that means, you're telling the enemy, I'm going to dwell continually in the presence of God until I dwell physically 
in the presence of God. Look at verses 6 and 7. When these things were all in place, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered into the most holy place or the holy of holies. And only then once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. So once a year, well, every day ministry was every day animals were being killed, sacrifices being made over the fact that people sinned. There were offerings that had to be made. And this was done continually because the blood of lambs and goats and bulls could not take care of the sin problem. And then once a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies to offer first for his own sin and then for the sins of the people, for the whole nation. And this became their religious duties. Now, all of this will change drastically when the, tabernacle, when the temple is destroyed in AD 70. And we go now more to a rabbinical uh, idea of Judaism without the uh, temple sacrifices. So the idea being that all of these things are types and shadows of what the Holy Spirit is going to begin to teach the church, teach these former uh, Jews, teach the new Greeks coming into the church, what all of these things mean that they're studying so that when they begin to worship, they know that they're worshiping the new covenant. See, the old covenant was to teach us. Look in verses 8 through 10. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. This is an illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who bring them. For that old system deals with the food and drink and the various cleansing ceremonies, washings and baptisms, physical regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. So the Holy Spirit goes on. Now I'm going to explain all of this to you. Remember, the early church didn't have small group. They didn't have a, a colleges of theology. They were dependent upon revelation to the Holy Spirit through the apostles. And as the Holy Spirit began to reveal, he said, look, the, the new could not come around until the old had to go, to, go away. It had, you see, what you, the, old te, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. To understand everything that God was trying to teach his people, he's saying, I need you to pay very close attention to the way things are and were so that you understand the changes that are coming. The old way was to teach the truth of the new covenant, to teach us what the new covenant would do and how it would not only change the conscience, the way you think, make you a new creature, which we'll begin to talk about, but help you to focus and find out who you are in Christ Jesus. But here is the danger. And this is why I wanted to kind of bring you through the tabernacle quickly because I want to hang on, on these last two points. Point number one is that we today live in danger of becoming formalistic. We go through the motions. We raise our hands when we're told to raise our hands. We close our eyes when we're told to close our eyes. We repeat when we're told to repeat. But at the end of the day, we are still the same people that we walked into church being. When we are told in scriptures, we are made to be new creations in Christ. We are meant to be new and different. That means when we come to worship, it should be an exciting moment because I'm not what I was yesterday. I'm getting better and better every day as the Holy Spirit changes my life. Notice what he says in Psalm 78 and 36. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouths and lied to him with their tongues. We go to church, oh, how I love Jesus, but I hate my neighbor. Oh, how I love Jesus, but I'm judging everybody in the room. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, he said, but to, he said to them, excellently and truly, so that there will be no room for blame, did Isaiah prophesy to you, I'm reading from the Amplified, the pretenders and hypocrites, as it stands written, these people constantly honor me with their lips, but their hearts hold off and are far distant from me. Their hearts hold off. In other words, you don't, you're not all in. What God is calling you and I to is to be all in. What God is calling you and me to is to be all in for worship, all in for singing, whether it's an old hymn, southern gospel, hillbilly gospel, contemporary gospel, or some of our newer songs, if the, th the theology is correct, he wants you all in. 
You can be all in in a sporting event, all in for a television show, but can you be all in for Christ? If you can be all in for Christ, you'll find that he is more enthroned in your life. You have more power. You've got more ability because know you not that you and me, but you and you and you are tabernacles, are temples of the Holy Spirit. Notice what Titus 1 and 6 said. These elders should be men who have been questionable integrity and are irreproachable, the husband of but one wife, whose children are well-trained and are believers, not open to accusation of being loose in morals and conduct or unruly or disorderly, because it becomes an outward show of righteousness. That's the second thing. You can be formal or you can just have an outward show of righteousness. I'm going to look the part, but I'm not the part. You see, in these last days, Paul told us, that people are going to be lovers of themselves. They're going to want to do their own thing. They're going to be focused on them. What he says is, what you need to do is understand in those last days when the love of many waxes cold, as Jesus would say, as many people become lawless and they begin to focus more and more and more and more on who the world is, then they miss out on who Jesus is. 2 Timothy 3 and 5, Paul writing to Timothy, says, For although they hold a form of piety, true religion, they deny and reject and are, stra- and are strangers to the power of it. Their conduct belies the genuineness of their profession. Avoid all such people. Turn away from them. He goes, they even deny and are strangers. Can you imagine as you read about the healing uh, revivals of the 50s and 60s and the charismatic outpouring of the 70s, the Azusa Street in the early 1900s, you saw true demonstrations of the power of God. But today you come into most churches, people, if God began to move, they're strangers to it. They don't know how to handle it. They don't know what to do about it. So the question becomes, what about you this morning? Are you a stranger to the power of God? Are you a stranger to what God wants to do in and through your life? Only you can answer that question. But let me say this. He loves you. And he wants you to be a part of the family. He wants you to not be a stranger to his power, but to walk in that power. He said these signs will follow those who believe. And he gives a list of things that should follow in your life if you believe. If you have supreme confidence in the character and power of God. If you have confidence in the power and the, and the character of God, then everything he's promised to you, you know, is yours. Everything that he's offered to you is yours if, if you're willing to say, here am I. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your love, your mercy, your grace, and your glory. I thank you, God, that you hear us when we pray and that you're able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can think or ask or even imagine. And, Father God, I pray this morning that there's anyone that doesn't know you in the free pardon of sin. Let today be the day they hear your voice and give you praise and give you glory and give you honor. And that name that is above every name, Jesus Christ, we give you praise. If you prayed that prayer, please, please email me at pastorstanspirit at gmail.com so that I can reach out to you and help and help you find places to worship. If you're in the Decatur area, please reach out to me, the Decatur, Texas area. I would like to start a real brick mortar ministry called Restoration right here. And if you're looking for a home church, I'd like to have started with some home meetings and see where we go from there. So we'll be right back. With some concluding, some closing I'm glad comments. Glad that you've been with us today, right here at Restoration. Don't forget, this is every week about the same time on both Facebook and on YouTube, and your and later on your favorite podcasting services. Don't forget to like and subscribe on Facebook so, or on YouTube, so that more people can get access to these programs. If you ever need me, I'm just one email away at pastorstansbury at gmail So until next week, I want grace and peace be multiplied into your life. We'll see you next week, right here on Restoration.